Hey everybody, Nikki here with the Inside Story and I am reading chapter 4 of Anna Dressed in Blood by Kinder Blake today. Um, sorry for the blank wall. I have a tapestry I'm putting up there but I've been rearranging my room and haven't gotten it up yet. Um, so that wall is not going to be blank. <laughs> it's kind of boring. But alright guys, so chapter 4, Anna Dressed in Blood. Would you rather be a Trojan or a tiger? My mother asked this while she's standing over the griddle making us cornmeal pancakes. It's the last day to register me for high school before it starts tomorrow. I know that she meant to do it sooner, but she's been busy forming relationships with a number of downtown merchants, trying to get them to advertise her fortune telling business and seeing if they'll carry her occult supplies. There's apparently a candle maker just outside of town that has agreed to infuse her product with a specific blend of oils. Sort of a candle spell in a box. They'd sell these custom creations at shops around town, and Mom would also ship them to her phone clientele. What kind of question is that? Do we have any jam? Strawberry or something called Saskatoon, which looks like blueberry. I make a sour face. I'll take the strawberry. You should live dangerously. Try the Saskatoon. I live dangerously enough. Now what's this about? Condoms or tigers? She sets a plate of pancakes and toast down in front of me, each topped with a pile of what I desperately hope is strawberry jam. Behave yourself, kiddo. They're the school mascots. Do you want to go to Sir Winston Churchill or Westgate Coll Collegiate? Apparently, we're close enough for both. I sigh. It doesn't matter. I'll take my classes and pass my tests, and then I'll transfer out, just like always. I'm here to kill Anna, but I should make a show of caring to please my mom. Dad would want me to be a Trojan, I say quietly, and she pauses for just a second over the griddle before sliding the last pancake onto her plate. I'll go over to Winston Churchill then, she says. What luck. I chose the douchey-sounding one. But like I said, it doesn't matter. I'm here for one thing. Something that fell into my lap while I was still fruitlessly casting about for, my, for the County 12 hiker. It came charmingly in the mail, my name and address on a coffee-stained envelope, and inside just one scrap of paper with Anna's name on it. It was written in blood. I get these tips from all over the country, all over the world. There are not many people who can do what I do, but there are a multitude of people who want me to do it, and they seek me out, asking those who are in the know and following my trail. We move a lot, but I'm easy enough to find if they look. Mom makes a website announcement whenever we relocate, and we always tell a few of my father's oldest friends where we're headed. Every month, like clockwork, a stack of ghosts, ghosts flies across my metaphorical desk, an email about people going missing in a satanic church in northern Italy, a newspaper clipping of a mysterious animal sacrifices near Ojibwe burial mound. I trust only a few sources. Most of my father's contacts, elders in the coven he was a member of in college, or scholars he met on his travels and through his reputation. They're the ones I can trust not to send me on wild goose chases, and they do their homework. But over the years, I've developed a few contacts of my own, and when I looked down at the scrawling red letters, cut across the paper like scabbed over claw marks, I knew that it had to be a tip from Rudy Bristol. The theatrics of it, the gothic romance of the yellowed parchment, like I was supposed to believe the ghost actually did it herself, etching her name in someone's blood and sending it to me like a calling card inviting me to dinner. Rudy, the Daisy Bristol, is a hardcore goth kid from New Orleans. He lounges around tending bar deep in the French Quarter, lost somewhere in his mid-twenties and wishing he were still sixteen. He's skinny, pale as a vampire, and wears way too much mesh. So far, he's led me to three good ghosts, nice quick kills, one of them was actually hanging by his neck in a root cellar, whispering through the floorboards and enticing new residents of the house to join him in the dirt. I walked in, gutted him, and walked back out. It was that job that made me like Daisy. It wasn't until later on that I learned to enjoy his extremely enthusiastic personality. I called him the minute I got his letter. Hey man, how do you know it was me? There was no disappointment in his voice, just an excited, flattered tone that reminded me of some kid at a Jonas Brothers concert. He's such a fanboy. If I allowed it, he'd strap on a proton pack and follow me around the country. Of course it was you. How many tries did it take you to get the letters to look right? Is the blood even real? Yeah, it's real. What kind of blood is it? Human? I smile. You used your own blood, didn't you? There was a sound of huffing and shifting around. Look, do you want the tip or not? Yeah, go ahead. 
My eyes were on the scrap of paper. Anna. Even though I knew it was just one of Daisy's cheap tricks, her name and blood looked beautiful. Anna Korlov, murdered in 1958. By who? Nobody knows. How? Nobody really knows that either. It's starting to sound like a crock. There are always records, always investigations. Each drop of blood spilled leaves a, tri a paper trail from here to Oregon. And the way he kept trying to make the phrase, nobody knows, sound creepy, was starting to wear on my nerves. So how do you know? I asked him. Lots of people know, he replied. She's Thunder Bay's favorite spook story. Spook stories usually turn out to be just that. Stories. Why are you wasting my time? I reached out for the paper, ready to crumple it in my fist. But I didn't. I know why. I don't know why, but I was being skeptical. Because all it... I don't know why I was being skeptical. People always know. Sometimes a lot of people. But they don't really do anything about it. They don't really say anything. Instead, they heed the warnings and cluck their tongues at any ignorant fool who stumbles into the spider's den. It's easier for them that way, and it's let, it lets them live in the daylight. She's not that kind of spook story, Daisy insisted. You won't ask around town and get anything about her, unless you ask in the right places. She's not a tourist attraction. But you walk in any teenage girl summer party, and I guarantee you they'll be telling Anna a story at midnight. Because I walk into a ton of teenage girl summer parties, I sighed. Of course. I suppose that Daisy really did, back in his day. What's the deal? She was 16 when she died, the daughter of Finnish Im immigrants. Her father was dead, and he died of some disease or something. Her mom ran a boarding school, a boarding house downtown, and Anna was on her way to school dance when she was killed. Someone cut her throat. But that's an understatement. Someone nearly cut her head clean off. They say she was wearing a white party dress, and when they found her, the whole thing was stained red. That's why they call her Anna Dressed in Blood. Anna Dressed in Blood, I repeated softly. Some people think that it was one of the boarders that did it. That some pervert took a look at her and liked what he saw, followed her, and left her bleeding in a ditch. Others say it was her date, or a jealous boyfriend. I take a deep breath to pull me out of my chance. It was bad, but they were all bad. And it was by no means the worst thing I've ever heard. Howard Sauberg, a farmer in central Iowa, killed his entire family with a pair of head shears, alternately stabbing and snipping as the case allowed. His entire family consisted of his wife, his two young sons, a newborn, and his elderly mother. Now that was one of the worst things I'd ever heard. I was disappointed to get to central Iowa and discover that the ghost of Howard Sauberg wasn't remorseful enough to hang around. Strangely enough, it's usually the victims that turn bad in the afterlife. The truly evil move on, to burn or turn to dust or be reincarnated as dung beetles. They use up all their rage while they're still breathing. Daisy was still going on about Anna's legend. His voice was growing lower and breathier with excitement. I couldn't decide whether to laugh or be annoyed. Okay, so what does she do now? He paused. She's killed 27 teenagers. That I know of. 27 teenagers in the last half century? It was starting to sound like a fairy tale again. Either that or the strangest cover-up in history. Nobody kills 27 teenagers and escapes without being chased into a castle by a crowd holding torches and pitchforks. Not even a ghost. 27 local kids? You've got to be kidding me. Not drifters or runaways? Well, well what? Someone's pulling your chain, Bristol. Bitterness grew in the back of my throat. And I don't know why. So what if the tip was fake? There were 15 other ghosts waiting in the stack. One of them was from Colorado, some grizzly Adams type who was murdering hunters on an entire mountain. Now that sounded like fun. They never find any bodies, Daisy said in an effort to explain. They must just figure that the kids ran away or were ducked in. It's only the other kids who would say anything about Anna, and of course nobody does. You know better than that. Yeah, I knew better than that, and I knew something else too. There was more to Anna's story than Daisy was telling me. I don't know what it was. Call it intuition. Maybe it was her name, scrawled out in crimson. Maybe Daisy's cheap and, mas and Mazo Chiswick's trick really did work, after all. But I knew. I know. I feel it in my gut. And my father always told me when your gut says something, you listen. I'll look into it. Are you going? There was that excited tone again, like an overeager beagle waiting to have his rope thrown. I said I'll look into it. I've got something to wrap up here first. What is it? I briefly told him about the County 12 hiker. He made some asinine suggestions on how to draw him out that were so asinine I don't even remember them now. And then, as usual, he tried to get me to come down to New Orleans. 
I went and touched New Orleans with a ten-foot pole. The town is haunted as shit, and all the better for it. Nowhere in the world loves its ghost more than that city. Sometimes I worry for Daisy. I worry that someone will get wind of his talking to me, sending me out on hunts, and then someday I'll have to be hunting him, some ripped-up victim version of him dragging his severed limbs around a warehouse. I lied to him that day. I didn't look into it any further. By the time I had gotten off the phone, I knew that I was going after Anna. My gut told me that she wasn't just a story. And besides, I wanted to see her dressed in blood. Alright, that was chapter four. We only have two more chapters left, guys. What are you guys' thoughts? Are you guys interested? Are you pe Is it piquing your interest? I think I'm definitely going to finish this book. So we've got two more chapters. So I'm excited to see where we go. I'm excited to see when he first meets Anna. Alright guys, so I will see you guys tomorrow for chapter 5.